Hello there, um, welcome to today's um, RCSLT Tracky webinar. Thanks all for joining us. I know it's really busy for us all at the minute, so I do really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Um, today we're looking at high flow nasal oxygen and swallowing, um, and this came from a planned study day that we had planned for, gosh, it was April last year now, where we were going to look at this in the context of lots of other bits of uh, MDT working, I suppose. So whilst this is a stand, today is a standalone webinar, it, it was supposed to sit within, within a series of, but we thought it would be really useful to have a look at um, in the context of now, I suppose, and how we're using uh, high flow nasal oxygen and, and, and possibly the impact or the impact on swallowing and what we need to be thinking about moving forward. Just try and change my slide. I can't seem to do it. So for those who don't know me, I'm Gemma Jones and I'm the chair of the Tracheostomy SEN. Um, and in my uh, day job, um, I'm the clinical lead for acute services uh, at Cardiff and Vale University Health Board. And I'm also the clinical lead uh, speech therapist for critical care. Um, today on our panel are our other members of the SEN committee. So Sarah Wallace, who's the consultant speech and language therapist in critical care at Manchester University Foundation Trust. We've got Claire Mills, who's a clinical specialist, speech and language therapist, also in critical care, and she's also doing an NIRH clinical doctorate. And Helen Newman, um, who is a clinical specialist, speech and language therapist in critical care at Barnet, who's also taking some time out of clinical practice to do some uh, research for a clinical research uh, doctoral uh, fellow. So thanks ever so much for joining us uh, today, guys, and they'll help us with the Q&A and, and contribute uh, after the presentation. From the point of view of our speakers today, we've got Paul Tooze, who's a clinical specialist physio um, with myself at Cardiff, who specialises in critical care, and Dr. Annalisa Sutt, who's a speech and language therapist, um, also specialising in uh, critical care, who are going to take a kind of uh, dual approach to, to talking to us today about high flow and swallowing. Um, after the presentations, as always, there's going to be a live Q&A session with the speakers and the panel members contributing. So please stick around for that. Um, what we'd ask is that any questions that you've got um, that you pop in the Q&A uh, tab, which is live now. So you can start doing this uh, as soon as you think about them. And we've got Helen, who's kind of manning the fort there for us to, to compile them for the end. There is a chat function as well, but if we can just only put uh, the the information for the Q and A in that tab, it will make us it will be easier for us to, to keep a touch of it. Um, the event's also being recorded and will be available for catch up, watch again um, on our YouTube channel, and the links there. And I think Helen's also popped it in the chat box for us. So um, and we will circulate it around after the event. So without further ado, I will hand you over, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll hand you over to Paul and Annalisa to take us through today's uh, presentations. Thanks ever so much, guys. Thanks, Gemma. And as Gemma will choose, I'm a clinical specialist. The critical care champion. And, and here today, really just to talk about um, high flow nasal oxygen and just an update on where we are, the recent evidence, the recent uses. Obviously, I'm not going to go into the swallow component because I'm going to leave that for Annalisa to look at afterwards. So, really, we're just going to spend the next 20 minutes talking about i'm having the same issues as Gemma. if it's slow not moving a lot of hot air really so we're gonna spend 20 minutes talking about high flow where it's come from it's kind of rationale for use and then some of the evidence behind it and this is taken directly off one of the the high flow providers websites but really what high flow is trying to do is provide that respiratory support through a reduction of dead space and dynamic positive airway pressure or as some people call it cpap or, or they will talk about that a bit later um Adds that airway hydration, um, which we've all seen of anyone that's been on high flow. The thought that it's more comfortable for the patient, certainly more comfortable than, than high levels of standard oxygen and comparisons with CPAP or NIV. And then the ability to provide supplementary oxygen up to 95 or up to 98%, depending on devices, 
to try and help support patients in respiratory failure. And its mechanism for action is in itself very complex and helps to support respiratory function in, in multiple different ways as this, as this flow chart kind of gives it. Sorry, guys, can you give me a heads up? Are you able to hear, Paul? Not at this moment, no, it froze. So he's not talking at the minute. I wonder, Paul, whether you come on here and I just move out the way. Sorry, we're in the same room and I wonder whether we are, um, we're having problems. Um, so he's not talking at the minute. So um, what I might do is I might, might get him, if you, if you share your presentation, it will come up on here and I'll move your screen from there. Sorry, we're uh, Am I back on? Uh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Wait a second. Yeah, but you froze, Paul, so it just keeps freezing on you visually as well as the audio. Is that better now? It is fun now. Can you hear me? Yes, echoing, but can I hear you? Yeah. Yeah, so can I carry on? Do you want to carry on? Do you want to? Sorry, just turn your mic. No, I'll mute you. Okay, sorry about that. I shall carry on from where we were. So, so there are lots of actions by which the, the high flow humidification can work. So we've got the heated humidification of the inhaled gas, that ability to wash out the upper airways due to the high flow of, of oxygen and air that's circulating above the larynx and then down into trachea. And then um, along with that, we've got that degree of positive airway pressure that will help for the recruitment of, of atelectic lungs um, and the entrainment of of oxygen above ambient air. So by delivering that high flow rate, we're able to, to maintain that high level of oxygen therapy that is otherwise lost with traditional oxygen therapies. And as you can see, as you work down through the chart, which, which um, really nicely explains how, how the process works, we through that process, we can reduce respiratory rates, reduce inspiratory effort and worker breathing and reduce the stress and strain on the lungs with the ultimate aim of increasing patient comfort, reducing ventilator lung injuries and, and overall improving oxygenation. So it is quite a complex pathway by which, by which it works. So what I'm going to try and do now is, is really talk about the how, the why and the when and use some of the research that's available to try and, and discuss some of those factors. Um, and as you'd expect, you, you know, over the last few years, there's been a massive increase in the number of papers, papers involving high flow. Um, and this year, for some reason, has seen a little bit of a surge as well. I can't possibly think why that might be. Um, but like I say, we'll talk about the who, the why, the where and the what. And there's kind of four main reasons that, that we tend to see high flow in use is, is a pre-intubation technique, a facilitation technique to permit early extubation in patients that otherwise may not be extubatable. And then in those that we do extubate as a rescue or curative technique and as a preventative or prophylactic treatment, either post extubation or actually to avoid um, intubation again in the first place, but for different reasons. So just to start with, I'll focus on the facilitation technique or rescue or curative therapies is that's where the bulk of the initial research was, was really founded. And a lot of it came through cardiothoracic surgery and, and Hernandez is kind of the, the leading light in terms of high flow in this kind of environment. And this is just one of the papers that they did, which was looking at whether high flow nasal cannula oxygen was superior to conventional oxygen therapy. Um, in preventing reintubation in relatively low risk patients. And certainly for me before reading this, I thought, well, why do you need high flow in low risk patients? They should be absolutely fine on, on standard therapy. 
Uh, and in uh, 527 um, patients involved that were low risk for reintubation, uh, proceeded to be extubated as planned and then went on to either high flow or conventional oxygen therapy with quite profound results in terms of, of reintubation rates. And you can see on the graph on the right that actually those that were in the conventional therapy group were at much higher chance of needing to be reintubated compared to the high flow therapy group. Um, considering this is a very low risk group, that was quite a, a marked difference between, between the two. And actually it's kind of more explained in, in this table where we look at um, all cause reintubation. And actually in the conventional therapy group, the con conventional oxygen therapy group, only, there were 12.2% of the patients needing reintubation. Whereas in the high flow group, it was only 4.9, which is quite a marked difference. And it was statistically significant as well. And kind of started the ball rolling to think, well, where else could we use, use high flow to try and prevent this, this risk of, of reintubation? Uh, further papers have then come since that time. So I'm just waiting for my slide to move through. Apologies, guys. There we go. Sorry about that. So in, in a, in a follow-up paper almost, we started looking at high flow nasal oxygen versus non-invasive positive airway pressure. Uh, I'm just trying to take it back one notch so you can see the first slide. But essentially they, they looked at a large group of patients that were post cardiothoracic surgery and they randomized them to either receive uh, NIV or, um, or to receive high flow oxygen therapy. Uh, and quite interestingly, it was a big number of patients, 830 patients, but the level of, of NIV that they actually delivered to this patient group was actually relatively low. Um, certainly only starting with an NIV pressures of an EPAP of four and an IPAP of eight, which, which in most rooms would be considered quite a low level of support. And uh, unsurprisingly, they found very little difference between, between the two patient groups. Uh, and obviously that was a bit of a surprise from a, from a research perspective. We'd seen from the low risk group, there was such a marked difference in, in those needing to be reintubated between conventional oxygen therapy, i.e. nasal cannula or face mask and high flow. But actually in this NIV group versus high flow, they still came out exactly the same. And they concluded that amongst these cardiothoracic patients with or at risk of respiratory failure, the use of um, high flow compared to NIV didn't result in a worse um, treatment failure rate and, and they were really looking at um, whether it was worse than rather than better than. But if you explore the information a little bit more and actually get more, more detail into the notes, what you actually see is the NIV group and the high flow groups were very, very similar in terms of their gas exchange when they were first extubated. And as you can see on here that their CO2s were relatively the same and their pH was the same. So really this was actually a group that didn't need NIV in the first place um, and are not a group that we would normally consider giving NIV for. Uh, and that kind of further expands itself when you actually look at the duration of treatment they received. So the high flow group in days one, day two and day three actually received nearly 18, 19 hours of high flow during the day. Whereas the NIV group only received kind of six hours a day. So they only spent about a quarter of the day actually receiving the NIV therapy. So what you can see immediately is you've got a complete mismatch in the way that the, the two groups were really treated. So kind of actually, you could reconclude this data that, that amongst a group of cardiothoracic patients at kind of slight risk of respiratory failure because their, their glasses were relatively normal, that the use of high flow was not worse than, than an NIV group of patients that didn't really need NIV. Um, so no real clearer through that process of what they were like for, for, for kind of our higher risk patient groups. We've obviously seen it used in a lot of other areas as well since then. So as a pre-intubation technique, and I promised myself I wasn't gonna mention the COVID word for an afternoon, but I've blown it within about three minutes. Um, and there has been a wealth of papers coming out over the last kind of 12 months, looking at the use of high flow in this COVID population. The one thing I've got to say is these are all retrospective studies in the main where they've looked back at patients that have 
been on high flow. The only prospective study that's going on at the moment is the Recovery RS study, which I'll, which I'll touch on just at the end. And I think for what most of us have seen in, in wave one, we saw very little high flow in use because of concerns around aerosol generating techniques and, and oxygen consumption and, and everything else. And then as we've moved into waves two, three, four, however many waves we're on to now, that actually we've become less concerned by that aerosol generation or, or the, re the availability of PPE means that we can do high flow in a much safer environment um, with reduced risk um, to staff. So I kind of talked about some of the papers and, and this is the first one is a high flow nasal oxygen in coronavirus 2019 with, with acute hypoxic um, respiratory failure. And like I said, this was a retrospective review. So patients either had no ventilation that had COVID, went on to high flow or they had um, either NIV or invasive ventilation. And we can actually see this, this was wave one data. This was actually from Wuhan data. Um, and actually very few people had high flow even in that wave. Uh, and what they discovered was actually there was little variance between the groups of those that had high flow and not had high flow. And the fact there was a general reduction in respiratory rate in those that, that were, on, were on the high flow in comparison. They also looked at those that passed and those that failed on high flow, if you can use failure as that word. And, and certainly what they found that those with a rock index and the rock index is comparing respiratory rate to saturations. Those with lower rock scores were more likely to fail. So they were starting to suggest that you might be able to use that an indicator or an early indicator of those that are likely to not uh, succeed on a high flow nasal oxygen trial and are more likely to require either CPAP or invasive ventilation. Um, further studies have been done, and I, and I really like this retrospective review. So this was to test the hypothesis that the high flow nasal oxygen reduces um, intubation rate and mortality in patients with COVID-19 admitted to ITU for respiratory failure. Uh, and this was 379 patients and it was across four critical care units within, um, within Paris. Uh, they set their, their guidance of what acute respiratory failure is that, that you can all, all read through. And they really just looked back through their notes to see how they did it. And there wasn't huge differences between the groups. Nothing particularly jumped out between them as to what was different when they were admitted to ITU for those that had high flow and those that didn't have high flow. The only interesting outcome really that, that, that flared is those that weren't on high flow were far more likely to require invasive mechanical ventilation at 28 days, whereas those that went in high flow initially were only about 56% of them um, ended up still being on a ventilator at, at 28 days. Just, just remember that does also include those that died within those 28 days. So obviously they were no longer on an invasive ventilator at that point. Uh, and unsurprisingly, you know, the graphs kind of match up with that, that we had this stepwise increase in the high flow group of those that needed mechanical ventilation. So they started to fail on days three through to days five, really, and needed to be intubated. Whereas those that didn't have high flow were obviously more likely to be intubated quicker because they weren't having any kind of other rescue therapy uh, involved with them. Apologies, I'm just waiting for the slide to move on again. Um, I'm going to carry on talking and hope it catches up. There we go. It's it's coming through. Um, so again, the utility of high flow nasal oxygen in, in COVID-19 pneumonia. This again was in this slightly differently was in a um, resource constrained setting. So they were trying to demonstrate that in areas where you didn't have a lot of mechanical ventilation available, could you use high flow instead? So they had 293 patients that were treated with high flow and a 47% success rate, i.e. They, they did well and they were um, discharged from hospital uh, by, by the time the study was completed with only 1% of those patients uh, dying whilst um, were still within hospital. But 53% of the patients failed high flow and either died from high flow, of which most of them had limitations in their treatment, and 71% went on to be intubated. Interesting, if you follow the flow chart through, actually of this high flow failure group, 139 of the 156 patients died before the time the study was completed. So actually it's really strong data there coming through that those that fail high flow are really on a sticky wicket and, and that the outcomes are, are not favorable. And, and I think a lot of us have found that, certainly in the first phases of, of wave two and wave three, that we've really seen those patients do, do struggle if they've been on high flow for any period of time and then require further treatment afterwards. 
Uh, just as a little bit more of an explanation, there wasn't actually that much difference between those that passed and that, that succeeded with high flow and those that failed and required additional therapies. Very minimal changes between their oxygen saturations and their heart rates, uh, and even their rock indexes. It was quite difficult to pick apart the two. Perhaps just rock just slightly lower, 3.26 versus uh, 2.41 in, in, the, in the failure group. Uh, and also what we saw is the longer you went on in terms of days of high flow, the more likely you are that you were going to fail high flow. So if we were sort of going up into day seven and beyond, there was kind of a 50-50 chance. Whereas those that succeeded early on on day two or those on day two had a much more success rate. But I think we would have expected those findings. Like I said, Recovery RS is, is in action at the moment. And that's the prospective study actually randomizing people to actually receive CPAP or, or high flow. Um, with a bunch of outcomes. So it's kind of eagerly awaited to see what the outcomes are of that. And just briefly, we obviously mentioned the use of high flow in preventative or prophylactic techniques to prevent extubation failure. I've actually taken a slightly different angle on that and, and talked more about use of high flow in tracheostomy patients as well, because I just want to bring it up as, as a topic that might come up in the, in the Q&A. This, uh, this study really looked at how high flow is delivered through, through tracheostomies and truly really tried to see how it affected respiratory mechanics uh, to see whether there was any real difference. And actually what they found is it seemed to work very differently to how it does through nasal oxygen. It didn't have the profound effects on respiratory rate that we saw when you were on it with nasal oxygen. It didn't necessarily have the profound effects on, on oxygenation that we'd seen um, in nasal oxygen either. So it kind of suggests that we may need to explore this area a little bit more uh, to gain a little bit more depth about how high flow can be used through tracheostomy. And I'm sure Annalisa will talk about this a bit more because there's a real difference between how different countries use high flow as part of tracheostomy weaning. And just on the side as well as just, just another group of, of locally, we looked at um, the use of high flow in patients following MaxVac surgery. So again, via a tracheostomy to try and uh, improve uh, outcomes following their surgery and certainly to reduce PPC rate. This was very much just a feasibility study, so only um, 20 patients in each group. 10 received high flow, 10 received standard oxygen therapy following their, following their MaxVac surgery. Actually, what we found was, was um, little difference in terms of their, their weaning times for their tracheostomy, but we kind of expected that when they're decannulated after five days anyway. But what we did see was quite a marked reduction in their length of stay, taking one and a half days median um, off their length of stay. And really all we could put that down to was the, the rate of PPC or the rate of patients requiring antibiotics for a presumed chest infection following surgery. Those in the high flow group uh, got no infections, no signs of infections, uh, no increases in their white cell count, whereas those on standard oxygen therapy, three out of the 10. Take it with a big pinch of salt because it was only 20 patients, um, but enough that we've changed our practice locally to, to continue that through. So really that's how I wanted to set the scene before going on to talk much more or allowing um, Annalisa to talk a lot more about uh, the use of high flow and the effect that it may have on the larynx. Um, just, just kind of one final slide to, to leave it with because I think it will come up in, in the Q&A sessions. Throughout the research, there's been a real mix of the flow rates being used on high flow. If you speak to the company, if you speak to Fish McHale, they will always say it's got to be above at least 50 litres, if not 60 litres, to have its maximum effect before we start weaning. What we can actually see from the trial data, it's been very variable through its process as to how much flow people have started on and how that's changed through. I'll leave you there and stop sharing and hand you over. Hey everyone, I will try and share my screen. Thank you, Paul, for this um, overview of high flow. Um, I will now talk about high flow oxygen um, and swallowing. And it really is a brief um, narrative uh, review. Um, and I do apologize if there's um, any omissions in terms of articles that are available and I wasn't able to find. Um, I've got no interest to declare and really I could just finish the talk here and say that in summary there's no real evidence about someone's ability to safely swallow Wilston high flow um, nasal oxygen but I will give you a brief overview of um, what's actually been done. So there's a bit of a timeline of um, high flow nasal cannula and swallowing studies that have been done and in summary there's um, one paper that's a survey of practice 
uh, one study done on um, little um, uh, lambs, two on healthy adult volunteers, four on neonates, and one bit of a controversial study um, on adults. I will briefly go um, through these. Um, so I'll start off with this um, uh, somewhat controversial study on adults, which um, sort of started the ball rolling in terms of looking at swallowing with um, high flow um, nasal oxygen. It was an observational study that was looking at commencement oral intake in uh, 50 um, neonatal ICU um, little ones and 50 adults from medical ICU. And Paul was talking about flow rates. Um, this study actually had an upper limit of, of flow, um, which was three liters per minute for um, the neonates and 50 liters um, for the adults and the average flow as you can see in the results here was actually two liters for neonates and only 30 liters a minute um, for adults one would um, argue whether this is high flow um, high high flow and um, they found that all of the 17 um, babies that were deemed um, appropriate to commence an oral intake were successful with initiation of oral feedings whilst on high flow and all of the 39 adults that were um, deemed appropriate to commence an oral intake resumed oral um, intake successfully whilst on high flow. And based on res these results, they made a very um, brave conclusion that it is not the use of high flow nasal oxygen, but rather patient specific determinants of feeding and swallowing readiness. And that their underlying medical condition is what impacts the readiness rather than the high flow nasal oxygen. And this conclusion um, received a bit of criticism. Um, we'd also a letter from um, Pamela Dodrell um, and her colleagues um, uh, from neonatal feeding world, um, really, I guess, cautioning people um, against these type of conclusions and really um, that more data was needed to be safely, to safely be able to say that um, especially neonates can um, have oral intake with nasal high flow. And the study on lambs was looking at sucking, swallowing and respiration um, on the nasal CPAP and um, high flow nasal cannula. And they found that nasal CPAP compared to nasal high flow decreased feeding duration and increased the rate of milk transfer and concluded that bottle feeding is safe on the nasal CPAP and high flow with no significant alteration in sucking, swallowing, breathing coordination. But obviously this is a preclinical pre study. So um, moving on with the um, neonate studies, um, there was a study looking at um, high flow nasal cannula again, continuing with um, nasal CPAP um, in um, infants with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And there were 72 infants in the study in two groups, one in nasal CPAP group and the other one in nasal CPAP group that moved on to high flow um, nasal cannula. And the study was looking at timing of commencement of feeds. And they found that both um, the start of first oral feeds and also um, the commencement of full oral feeds was earlier in the group that started with nasal CPAP but moved on to high flow nasal cannula. Um, the next study was also looking at the same thing um, in preterm infants, and it was an RCT. Um, and they had 44 infants randomized to high flow group versus nasal CPAP and actually found no significant difference between the groups um, in terms of when they achieved full, full oral feeding. And in fact, if you look at the data, they, they, it was slightly towards um, favoring nasal CPAP. Um, so two sort of different results from there. Another um, a pilot study has been done, a pilot RCT has been done looking at the same thing. And um, infants were again randomized to nasal CPAP or a high flow nasal oxygen. Um, the study being a pilot study obviously had very small numbers. There were 12 um, infants that completed in the nasal CPAP group versus 13 in the high flow group. Um, but they found that um, infants in the high flow group reached full feeds seven days earlier than those in the nasal CPAP group. So very promising results, but um, it was a feasibility study. And they concluded that based on their retention rate, um, an adequately powered RCT can be performed. So hopefully we'll soon know whether high flow nasal, um, nasal cannula or nasal flow could be associated with achieving oral feeds earlier in neonates. But moving on to, um, uh, sorry, not moving on to adults yet, but the survey of practice that was then done um, 
knowing now that we don't have a lot of sort of supportive or, or non-supportive data about um, feeding infants uh, whilst on high flow. Um, there was a survey done in Australia and New Zealand um, where 38 hospitals took part and they found that with, um, they reported that with high, um, sorry, nasal high flow, 38% of the units often feed infants whilst they're on nasal high flow and 41% of units sometimes do so versus I'm not going to go into nasal CPAP because that's not um, the um, focus of the today's talk. But they were also looking at where this happens more frequently comparing NICU and PICU. And um, in NICU, um, they fed um, little ones uh, on high flow nasal cannula more often than they did so in PICU. But again, because there's not much data, 80% of all units reported that they do not actually have a written policy or guideline to support them um, uh, whilst feeding infants receiving non-invasive respiratory support. Looking at adult volunteers, um, this first study was done on nine, nine male volunteers in Japan where they were injected with five milliliters of water over three seconds on the three different flow conditions of 15, 30 and 45 liters a minute via nasal cannula. And they were looking at timing of swallow onset um, using EMG. And they found that the mean latency times for the swallowing reflex with all of these different flows were significantly shorter than those under control conditions. So they thought that nasal high flow may actually enhance swallowing function. Um, and another um, actually really good PhD by Katie Allen was looking at um, physiology of swallow with nasal high, high flow. And she was trying to answer the question um, of whether high flow stents the airway open. Um, she had 29 healthy adults on very different um, liters of nasal um, high flow or low flow and had five raters um, looking at video fluoroscopic images assessing laryngeal vestibule closure um, during these different conditions. And she found that laryngeal vestibule closure was complete on all swallows. So there was no stenting open of the airway um, and flow, flow conditions impacted the duration of closure, closure, but not the closure reaction time. And she found that the duration was actually longer for high flow conditions. And she um, suspects that um, this may indicate adaptation to maintain airway protection. But I just reminding you that these were healthy volunteers. There's another study that's underway. It was underway in May 2020, but I couldn't find any updates. It's a very um, interesting um, protocol for an RCT where they're looking at um, saliva swallowing um, or breathing and swallowing coordination, really. Um, and swallowing of saliva during daytime nap in patients with COPD. Um, so we can look out for these results. But that's about it um, in terms of um, in terms of data out there. I thought I'd just give a few thoughts based on my personal experience um, working with patients um, on nasal high flow. And as Paul said, their practices are very different around the world. And when I was working in Australia, then um, in a cardiothoracic ICU, then certainly um, extubation onto high flow nasal oxygen was very, very, very common. Um, and there's a few studies actually from our unit too, looking at um, what's happening um, with um, patients' lungs using EIT um, whilst they're on high flow versus um, low flow but that I haven't um, given any results of these studies as part of my talk here today. Um, but in my practice, definitely presence of high flow nasal oxygen never precluded any swallow assessment. Um, and um, what I witnessed sometimes was what I suspected to be aspiration from premature spillage whilst the patient was on high flow nasal oxygen. But again, looking at the data that I've just presented, um, the data from healthy volunteers doesn't certainly doesn't support that because healthy volunteers, they found that their airway, the swallow latency time was um, shorter, meaning that they initiated the swallow quicker when they were on nasal high flow and their airway remained closed for longer, um, the higher the flow. But again, would high flow nasal oxygen have a different effect in a damaged pharynx or larynx post endotracheal um, tube? Because we know now that high flow does not stent the airway open in a healthy volunteer, but an endotracheal tube has been doing just that, you know, for up to maybe two weeks in some of these patients. And um, there is a high prevalence of laryngeal injury post the period of being intubated. Um, and we know that from Martin Brodsky's um, uh, review, sorry, that enhanced swallow doesn't need to be here, but you'll know what it means soon. 
Um, we know these symptoms and the prevalence percentage of all these symptoms post um, endotracheal intubation um, and add high flow nasal oxygen to it. I don't think this results in enhanced swallow. So a patient, patient post um, endotracheal um, intubation uh, receiving high flow nasal oxygen um, yeah, my, my, my thoughts would be that um, without high flow nasal oxygen, the swallow um, might be better than with high flow, but who knows? I can, I can, so my, my strong feeling is that it definitely doesn't enhance the swallow as it does in healthy normals. So what do we need? We need a clinical study looking at different flow rates and swallowing in post extubation patients, definitely using um, some imaging and ideally using different fluids um, and food consistencies also. It is a great PhD. Any takers? Anyone want to do a great PhD? Um, Paul mentioned high flow um, tracheostomy as well. Um, and seeing that it is a tracheostomy sen, um, I thought I'd mention it briefly also. Um, as Paul also mentioned, there are very few studies looking at high flow tracheostomy in the first place. And there are certainly no studies looking at high flow flow tracheostomy and swallow. So um, for more impact of, on, of any flow to have um, anything to do with swallow, one would need to have the tracheostomy cuff inflated, um, plus minus one way valve. But if we compare high flow tracheostomy to say someone being on a ventilator with their cuff down, then high flow, um, the flow from high flow trachea um, certainly, you know, doesn't even get close to um, the flows and the pressures created um, or the flow created by the pressures coming from the ventilator. And obviously with the tracheostomy tube, we're now thinking um, the direction of the flow as well. With nasal high flow, you have um, that nasal high flow pushing down towards the airway. So we're thinking perhaps, you know, it would increase the risk of aspiration in some of our patients. Whereas with high flow tracheostomy, the air is now being pushed up towards the patient's upper airway. So perhaps even protecting them somewhat from aspiration of saliva, some food fluid consistencies, some, you know, um, perhaps residue post swallow. Um, and also comparing high flow tracheostomy to room air then, or it's just the tracheal mask, then high flow would probably highly likely provide more air towards the upper airway compared to just room air and um, tracheal mask um, or any leak from it. Um, so again, another area of um, potential um, research, because there is absolutely no data there, but who knows, maybe, you know, we'll do some research and we find out that there's no effect whatsoever. And that is um, the end of my slides. Um, I'm looking forward to a great discussion and I'll stop screen sharing and hand it back over to Gemma. Hi there, amazing. Thanks ever so much Annalisa and Paul um, for that. Um, yeah, I think lots of discussion in the light of kind of mixed evidence, no evidence, um, and I suppose really just about what we're all doing in clinical practice. Um, just out of interest, I think I've just seen somebody pop up if you've, if um, on the chat to say that there is somebody doing a PhD looking at high flow and swallowing. If perhaps whoever it was could put some more information about that in the chat box, because it would be really useful to, to hear from you. Um, oh, you were joking. OK, don't worry. I got my uh, got my hopes up. Um, OK, so if, if all the panel could turn back on their um, videos, apart from you, Paul, probably, because you can come here or talk there. OK. Um, Right then, and, um, and and I'll hand over to Helen then to see what was happening on the Q and A, um, and see if we can come up with any any questions for Annalisa, Paul, the panel. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions, but do feel free to send in some more. Um, so one of the first ones was a question, a request for SLTs that have ICU guidelines or swallow screens that they'd be willing to. Share with the group uh, around readiness for oral intake and NIV slash high flow. And uh, leading on from that, uh, when to refer to SLT for the other, the wider MDT. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Does anybody uh, so it was about <laughs> if there's any, um, just to summarize, any screens that we're using? So just, 
I know whether any. Yeah. Is it, are there... Annalisa, go. If anyone has a guideline, um, that specific guideline, I, I'd love to hear about that. So I, yes. I have to admit that I've never seen one. Me neither. And no. does anyone have a working a working rule of thumb about when they would do a swallow assessment with someone on high flow and perhaps when they wouldn't? So just to say, I mean, one of the things that is out there is, I don't know whether anyone's seen the Swallow Study blog. Um, uh, Karen Scheffler did an article on high flow nasal oxygen and she's kind of developed a, a kind of protocol for what to do and when to assess and what to look for. So that's the only thing that I think I know is out there, but it hasn't been validated. Um, and I think likewise for screens, I think, although I think some people talk about the Yale protocol um, as being validated, it hasn't been validated specifically in hyphonasal oxygen. Um, so there is, it's been validated, but not in ICU patients. There was one study looking at the Yale in critical care patients, but it doesn't give any specifics about what respiratory support they were on um, and it wasn't a validation study so although I, I personally think the water swallow test is a, is a good um, thing to use as part of your swallowing assessment with high flow patients I think you have to bear in mind that it hasn't been validated and I think um, it needs to be used kind of cautiously with that in mind. Mm -hmm. Sorry what was the name of what the reference the other reference you gave? Um, the, it's Swallow Study blog. Um, so I think if you just, if you Google Swallow Study, um, there's a, yeah, she's developed some kind of protocol there. But yeah, as I said, it's not, it's not been validated, but it's, it's, I think it's something useful to um, guide your thinking um, as you go and see these patients, what kind of things do you need to be thinking about? Yeah. OK, um, we had a question about one of the papers you mentioned, Paul, the Hernandez paper. What was the conventional therapy just in that study? Yeah, it's just standard oxygen therapy in that study. So whatever the patient needed to maintain their SATs above 94. So nasal specs, face mask, whichever the option was, and then versus high flow in that, in that first, first paper. Lovely. OK. Um, I had another question about instrumental assessment and fees, uh, fees with high flow nasal oxygen. Um, practicalities of doing fees when you've got a patient who's on high flow. Yeah, um, so I think it's, it's important that you think about the fact that you're going to be occluding the nasal passage. I mean, it's, it's, it's logistically possible to just slightly lower the cannula and pass a scope because it's only entering the, the nostril very short, uh, very short, isn't it, the cannula? So you can get a scope in, but the fact that you're actually then with the scope occluding that side of the nose could, could potentially be quite detrimental to that patient's respiratory status. They could desaturate. Um, they might not, they might cope. But I think the thing I always try to suggest to people and do myself is that to have that conversation with a physio colleague uh, staff nurse about whether you think the patient will tolerate that um, they should be on SATS monitor anyway uh, but if they're not put them on one while you're doing your fees and just uh, be very clear what um, your bo bottom level of saturations uh, is for that patient individually before you um, stop the assessment if you need to, if they desaturate to that point. So just you just have to think about the fact that you're, you know, that you're actually obstructing partially the, uh, the respiratory support that they're on and it might be detrimental. I've certainly done it on patients on high flow, but only when you've considered all of those, those things and, put, and mitigated for those risks. Yeah. So again, another example of in respiratory care ICU where having your MDT physio colleagues, nursing colleagues there with you while you do the assessment. Yeah, and it's so okay. useful for everybody, I think, to work that way, isn't it? And just to keep keep your patients safe, but also learn from each other about, you know, just how stable they are uh, if you're doing a procedure like that. And it might be pertinent to wait 
Yeah. Um, any standard precautions or risk assessments that you'd do with everybody? Any exclusion criteria, uh, flow rate or anything else? Nope. I think, um, you just, I think you just use your the what you would apply to every patient, which is, you know, your uh, you know your list of things that you would talk to the nurse and your MDT colleagues about is whether they're going to be able to tolerate assessment. But I don't sort of regard high flow nasal as any different from you know those sorts of things I consider with every patient, um, particularly. It's just are they going to tolerate sitting up? Are they alert enough? All of those things. I'm not sure. Do you have any other things, Annalisa, Claire? There was something about, uh, I know that there's a discussion I've had with colleagues about whether you would turn down, you know, a particularly high flow rate for a swallow assessment. And I think, again, that's not, you know, there's, there's no uh, particular evidence about flow rate necessarily impacting on swallow I suspect if they're dysphagic as Annalisa said it's all the other things the damage to the larynx post intubation and the those kind of things that are the issue and I think you know one would argue that if they're on a particular flow rate they're on it for a reason so actually us turning it down <laughs> just for our assessment potentially either will make them more short of breath which potentially increases the risk of any any dysphagia or, or aspiration from shortness of breath and consequences of respiratory function but also as well it's not really our place to be uh, to be doing that certainly in isolation I mean again maybe it's part of a conversation or a timing of assessment thing but I think you know anything like that as Sarah said it would be kind of looking at the patient as a whole and flow rate being or um, presence of high flow being one of the factors or you know considerations but certainly most of the other things that one would normally look at in timing and readiness for assessment. I think yeah. the only other thing to add to that, Gemma, that's a really, really, really good point, is that if they are on various different flow rates at different times of day, you may want to assess their swallow under those conditions so you know that later on when you're not there and they're having their tea um, and their flow rate is different, potentially, that you've actually checked them out in all, all conditions. But yeah, I agree with you completely. I think it's even comparable to, you know, we mentioned the high flow tracheostomy too, but it is comparable to um, someone receiving different levels of support via tracheostomy. And we, we assess them, you know, whether they're safe with a speaking valve whilst they're on their pressure support ventilation, we, we assess them again mm -hmm. if they're safe um, once they're, you know, tra on tracheomask, mask, perhaps on some of those very borderline patients. So I think it's the same principle really but the flow is just coming from a different angle and we need to think about what sort of an impact will would that potentially have on a patient's flow if it's significantly different um, at different times of day. I, I think I think one of the things that I will do often is is give quite prescriptive recommendations so if I you know if if I know that they're going to be fluctuating, that the physios or nurses are going to be changing the high flow is, I'll say, you know, they can eat and drink when they're on this level of support or, um, and that they need reviewing. Um, so I think it is really important to work really closely with, with the physios looking after the patient and the nurses and knowing what the plan is for that patient in terms of how that respiratory support is going to be changed. Okay, we've got um, another question about airway sensitivity. What's the effect of high flow on airway sens sensitivity and perhaps cough? Probably not much evidence, but <laughs> clinical experience. I, I, I might say something if that's all right. Um, I think my experience, I think from when I, I quite often will assess them at different levels, obviously working with, with the team looking after them as to what, what I can change the settings to. Um, and one of the things that I find is that they, um, they look okay on higher flows of say 50, but as you bring the flow down, they start overly aspirating. And I think, yes, we don't have that evidence, but I think it kind of is a reasonable, um, you know, it's reasonable to think that higher flows are going to impact more on sensation. Um, and I think that's one of the things we need to be careful with those with those higher flows is, um, I think there probably is a higher risk of silent aspiration, even though we don't actually have the evidence to that. 
Um, and, and just thinking back to Annalisa's um, comments on some of those papers, I think one of the issues with those um, research looking at healthy people is it's looking at really short applications of high flow nasal oxygen, you know, for a few mm -hmm. minutes. Um, and it that isn't going to tell you what experiencing high flow for two days is going to do in terms of sensation and swallow frequency and airway closure. So I think you need to kind of, we need to bear that in mind and we really need the research. Yeah, can I add to that? I think, I think in my experience, I don't know of any papers on this, there might be some papers, but just thinking back to the last webinar when we talked about sense, sense, sensation that I think you find that some patients go, it can go either way. So you can have some patients who are really, really sensitive with high rates of flow and feel almost like they, you know, they're fighting it and they feel like they uh, almost shut things down in the, in the larynx a little bit as a, as a protection response. So you could find that that's, it could be helpful, but it could be detrimental. It could be, could go either way. And like you say, Claire, others, they're, they're so desensate, it doesn't really matter what flow rate you've got them on, they're just going to, with the air blasting downwards, potentially aspirate more the higher you turn the rate up. So I think it's, you just need to really look at your patient and see what, what you think is happening in terms of sensory response. But I think it could go either way. I'd be interested to know if there's some papers though, if anyone knows of any. And leading on from um, talking about the healthy um, volunteer studies, I was wondering, Annalisa, um, how much do you think there's a role of the healthy volunteers having that capacity to compensate rather than the high flow making the swallow better? And um, whether those studies have addressed that, overlooked it, um, and how that would transfer to our frail population of patients? Mm. Yeah, great questions. <laughs> it, uh, I don't know, they haven't addressed it um, um, as, you know, comparing these then, um, whether they're comparable to our um, frail populations or anything. I think there's always a role for, you know, for these both preclinical studies and um, healthy volunteer studies, because that sort of builds us the base of where to, where to grow um, our clinical studies from. But mm. um, yes, in the environment where we don't have the clinical studies, I don't know how much we can conclude from the from the preclinical or the healthy volunteer studies as we've been discussing and i think there's another question i'm sure you're gonna um you were gonna ask um about it but there was um someone's asking about the neonates and um i'm wondering whether the increased latency would be a challenge um and lead to the clinical observations of apnea instability of suck swallow breathe and an already compromised respiratory pattern um mm. and you know that's the same thing the the increased latency was showed was shown in a healthy volunteer study. How translatable would mm. that be to um, poor little sick neonates? No, not very much probably, but maybe. And until we have studies on that, we don't know. Um, there was this preclinical study looking at little lambs where they said that there was no impact on swallow breathing, suckling coordination. Um, the high flow didn't have an impact on that, but how, many, how much the full term little lambs, you know, how much does their swallow compare to uh, neonates that are really sick. Don't know. And I think that's why also um, Pamela Todrell's um, response to Stephen Leader's article was very, you know, very straightforward and very, very warning um, for the clinicians because those, um, you know, bold conclusions from, from studies that don't actually look at what's happening with the swallow, we, we just can't do that. We, we can't do that. Mm. And is anyone aware of any um evidence on the long-term impact on vocal cord function or voice from high flow? Not aware of any, but I think um, it's a really interesting point. And I noticed that when we have um, patients on high ventilatory support, pressure support and cuff down for long periods, um, sometimes they get very, very dry um, even though it's humidified, obviously, they get very dry and very sort of rough voices for a while and can feel irritation sometimes. So it's a really interesting point. I wonder if there's another study <laughs> to be done. 
It's a lot of work Not to be done. <laughs> I think if you're going to blast airflow past the larynx and through, you know, there's boards, it's, it's potentially going to cause some change to the mucosa. Yeah. Um, there was a comment that um, empirically um, there would be the, the suggestion that high, the higher the flow, the greater the possibility of reduced airway clearance, um, which apparently has been seen in spinal cord, cord injury. Any thoughts of that, maybe, Paul? Yeah, like everything, I think it's an area for further exploration. You know, one of the major reasons we use high flow is actually to improve secretion clearance. And, and most of the studies in the post extubation group would suggest that, that secretion clearance is better in a high flow group compared to comparisons. But there's always going to be these individual groups of patients that probably behave differently uh, or may become oversaturated by the high flow may actually be more their problem is, is it's almost too much for them. Uh, so again, it's just an area that we're going to have to keep keep exploring. But you know, I would say on the general, we prefer high flow for secretion clearance, certainly more than we okay. say CPAP or high flow or, or um, NIV. Um, but there will be individual groups that probably respond differently to it. And and what's the mechanism? Why is it that high flow might be better at secretion clearance? It's just the, the heated humidification factor that, that you're adding um, and also the, you know, what goes in must come out. So if you're increasing flow rates going in, then you should be able to generate better expiratory flows coming back out the other way. Um, but, it, but what we tend to see in patients that are on CPAP or NIV or on, on standard oxygen therapy that's not humidified, that's the, the group that will get the thick tenacious secretions that are difficult to clear. Whereas those on high flow, the secretions tend to be more easy to move and their upper airway is more moist and, and you know, able to clear those secretions much better. Mm -hmm. Okay, I've um, got another question for you, Paul. Um, you mentioned high flow provides airway hydration. So I think you probably just touched on that actually. Um, what's the functional impact of this on mucociliary escalation and airway clearance in your patients? Yeah, so yeah. God, as we kind of touched on it really, that's what we're hoping to see is that additional hydration effect will, will aid secretion clearance both through thinning of the of the saliva of the secretions itself, but also you know the moistening of the mucosa allowing that clearance to happen. We've we've all seen those patients that have just got dried on thick stuff on dried on concrete mucosa that's just not going to budge um, and the effect of keeping them much more moist will allow that to to clear a lot better. Okay and then at the end of that there was a suggestion that if there is a benefit then perhaps patients who aspirate smaller amounts might be less at risk so I don't know if anyone wants to um, have a has any ideas on that. I think perhaps the suggestion is that if they're able to, to clear it, then perhaps they're able to tolerate a bit more aspiration. Again, it's going to be on a very individual basis, won't it? And mm -hmm. depend on the respiratory and, and kind of medical status of that patient, their mobility. You know, I don't think we can kind of yep. generalise that comment at all yeah. um, about it. And again, depending on where the patient's at and what their, their wishes are with regards to everything about level of risk, isn't it? So it's again, it's a... It's a kind of patient by patient discussion, I think. So, yeah, I think we might have to leave it there coming towards the end. Um, thanks ever so much to the panel, to Paul and Annalisa um, for that um, for that discussion. And obviously lots more research and thoughts uh, need to be happening really about this area that I suppose we're using and seeing far more. There's a few general queries that I can see in the chat box just about how many centres are using high flow on tracheostomies in, in either high dependency or ICU settings. And I suppose there's something again about, sorry, my mask, I obviously sitting close to Paul, so that's why it's on, hope it's okay. Um, and there's something about any protocols um, like Claire was mentioning about about her patients on high flow. So I suppose as a send, we're happy to collate anything that you may have that you want to kind of share. If you send it to the, to us at the send, we can kind of pop an email out to members as a as a follow up to this. If there is anything out there that people know about. 
Um, just to finish up then, um, as always, our next uh, webinar is planned for the 10th of May. We will send round a, a, a reminder with a, with a link about that rather than me sharing my screen now. Um, and actually, um, thank you, Helen. She's pop Helen's just popped it in the in the chat box there. So it's a link that you can click on as always, a Zoom link. And it's going to be Louise Edwards, our paediatric colleague, looking at compassionate care in paediatric tracheostomy patients. And I think what we really want to say here is one, reach out to the paediatric tracky uh, community that also are members of our SEN for, for this really interesting discussion and, and presentation, but also be, be mindful that even if we don't work in that setting, that actually there's probably a lot of uh, things that are transferable, relatable, um, that, that, will, that Louise will bring up. And obviously as well, some of these paediatric patients will become our adult uh, patients as well. So please don't think that because you work in adults, it's it's not relevant for you. I'm um, pretty sure working and speaking to Louise, that that is going to be the, you know, it is very applicable across uh, across the client groups. And the final thing, as always, is just a plea for some feedback and some uh, volunteers. We're hoping, as always, to continue to ru run this webinar series as long as we need to and can't be face to face. So we're always looking for volunteers for presentations. We've got a few exciting things lined up. Um, coming up hopefully with the Passy Muir uh, guys um, over in America and doing some webinars with them as well. So some exciting things coming up, but we're always looking for, for, uh, for you guys to volunteer as well. So please uh, get in contact and fill in our feedback form, which is always also on the, um, on the chat box. But thanks ever so much for joining, uh, for joining us. I hope you have a, a very happy rest of your week. Um, hope it's okay out there. Look after yourselves and, and take care until next time. Thanks ever so much.